Mother of Pentecostals and Charismatic is all right. <laughs> Good morning. We are ready to start. So good morning once more. I am Angelique Walker-Smith and I will be serving as your talk show moderator for the Justice Plenary. You are most welcome to this Justice Plenary where we will consider very difficult issues but not without hope. Please, you are invited to think about the issues of justice in your own context as we reflect globally about these matters. We have some fine experts to introduce to you today, but before we enter into our justice plenary, we now bring to you our general secretary, the Reverend Dr. Olaf Teft. He is coming now to give the greetings. Good morning. Um, thank you, moderator. We need to share with you some information. First of all, we remind the delegates that there is an extra business plenary from one to two hours today to finish the election processes. The departium is also something we need to be aware of and uh, please pay attention to this. There will be shuttles to the airport from the hotels on the 9th and the 10th. November. You will find a departure schedule at your hotel. And because of traffic and international check-in, you should plan to leave the hotel four hours, four hours before your departure time. If you are leaving before the 9th of November or after the 10th of November, ask your hotel for information about the airport limousine bus and make your own arrangements. And if you would like to double check your return flight, the RAP team travel can be helpful. They are at the information desk in the Madang Hall. If you leave by train, please take a taxi to the train station and you should leave for the station one and a half hours before your train departs. Then, greetings we will share with you today. And I have the great pleasure to announce that we have greetings from the Secretary General of the United Nations, Dr. Ban Ki-moon, who is not able to be here, but we will listen to his greeting read by our Madrata. Thank you, General Secretary. I believe you find the letter on the screen. Greetings. It is a pleasure for me to share with you now greetings of the Secretary General of the United Nations, Dr. Ban Ki-moon. The Secretary General writes, quote, I am pleased to send greetings to all participants at the 10th Assembly of the World Council of Churches. I applaud the WCC for its work with the United Nations and to advance our common goals. Our world today is beset by challenges that cross geographical, cultural, and religious lines. Climate change, poverty, environmental degradation, conflict, and other threats demand a global response by governments along with other partners, including non-governmental organizations and religious groups. As we focus on broad global challenges, we must pay close attention to people as key agents of change. Religious leaders can have an enormous influence on their followers and are well placed to help bring about a change in mindsets that can lead to progress in society. By spreading messages of respect, compassion, and love, WCC members can combat bigotry and hatred and foster greater tolerance and trust. 21st century realities such as economic integration, migration flows, and environmental concerns underscore how we must work across identity lines to reach our shared goals from resolving conflicts to empowering young people to bringing the, the poor and vulnerable in from the margins. 
The United Nations Alliance of Civilizations provides a platform where governments, religious leaders, businesses, and civil society groups, especially those representing young people, can stand up for inclusivity and against extremism. I count on all of you to contribute to this effort by helping to lay the foundations of trust and friendship on which we can build lasting peace and prosperity in our world. We will refer to the warm reception of these greetings and thank the Secretary General of the UN appropriately. Let me now turn to the All Africa Conference of Churches. The AACC celebrated this year its 50th anniversary in Kampala, the capital city of Uganda. The AACC had taken the decision to adopt the WCC assembly theme as a sign for close relationships and the need for greater coherence in the ecumenical movement. So the ASCC chose to add something, and the theme was God of life, lead Africa to peace, justice, and dignity. I had the privilege and the honor to be present and to greet the assembly on behalf of the World Council. And therefore, I'm also pleased that I now can give the floor to the ASCC General Secretary, Reverend Dr. Andre Karamaga, Please. It is my pleasure and honor to bring greetings to this August Assembly of the World Council of Churches on behalf of my colleagues working with regional ecumenical organization even the network of National Council of Churches and, of course, the fellowship of the All Africa Conference of Churches to be able to salute and congratulate the World Council of Churches who has been able to bring us together in order to dream together and to celebrate a great miracle. When Jesus commissioned his disciples and told them that all the authority has been given to him in heaven and earth, he told them to go to all nations and baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And the same Jesus asked the eleven to bring the good news from Jerusalem to Judea, Samaria, and reach each corner of earth. Eleven person. It was no gender balance like nowadays. Eleven person to reach each corner of earth. No one can believe that this is possible. You said it well, General Secretary, and thank you for having witnessed the General Assembly of the All Africa Conference of Churches. And thank you for having represented this wonderful membership to the Assembly of the European Conference of Churches, to the Assembly of other regional fellowships. We are very, very happy to see WCC representing this membership. It is very, very important. In Kampala, we brought it together about 1,000 persons. And the most important fact I want to report here is that these persons came from each corner of Africa. This is very important for us because when I was younger, 
Africa was considered as the mission field. Now, the missionary church in Africa has reached each corner of Africa. What is what we had from this assembly? We had two things, many things, but I want to report about two. One is this situation of the presence in each corner of Africa. The second one is a discovery which started some years back to discover that Christianity in Africa is rooted in African spirituality and Africa is not a pagan continent, is not an animist continent. We discovered, and it was affirmed in a book published by Professor Mbiti, that from time immemorial, Africa has been believing in one God. And we found the name of this God in each, each language of Africa. So, we affirmed that even the Judaic monotheism has been influenced by Africa because the Jewish people spent 400 years in Africa and then influenced also the monotheism of Christianity. So we want to forgive those who called us pagans and animists, but we want that to stop. Then, this is my third assembly of the World Council of Churches I have a chance to attend. Whenever I attend this assembly of the World Council of Churches, I have a strong feeling to be witnessing a miracle. You brought us here and we come from each corner of earth. The miracle has happened. Eleven persons, now we have people from each corner of earth. Is it not a miracle? <laughs> Friends, I was wondering if this commission was given to us. We are not 11. I was told that we are about 3,000. For the first time, we are given this mission. I suspect we could have motions from the assembly saying that let us command a, a feasibility study. Let us budget about communication fees, including interpretation. We will never achieve it. But it has happened. Glory be to the God. General Secretary, that is what I want to remind to celebrate. And then, I, we came to wonder, now, the first commission said to go to each corner of earth. Now it has been reached. What to do, what do we do next? I am not proposing to stop the mission. I am not proposing to, we have challenges. But maybe time has come to move from each corner again to the center. But I don't want to highlight that because I know if we have to agree on each center, it will, it will take us weeks without agreeing. But I know that the World Council of Churches has brought us once Harare was the center, another time Porto Alegre was the center, this time Busanis gives us a space. But this question of the center is very risky. We are now told as Africans that we are becoming the center of gravity of Christianity. I was a person attempted by this nice saying, but I don't want us to fall into that temptation. The center of gravity of Christianity is Christ.
And I wanted to encourage those, especially Africans, especially those calling themselves Protestant, to protest against this temptation. <laughs> the mission from each corner to the center, but also the mission from each corner to another corner so that we have the fellowship. And if we have this movement, the World Council of Churches, giving us the leadership, we will reach somewhere. General Secretary, we have uh, celebrated and enjoyed the great value of complementarity. As you said well, like other regional ecumenical organization, the All Africa Conference of Churches happened to have common membership with the World Council of Churches, and by collaborating around the theme, we have really shown that we don't want to confuse our constituency. I am happy you were the first to understand by our history why we also wanted to add dignity. And we came to understand that dignity is not only a right, it is also a gift from God who made us in his image. A lot of media secretary and uh, profit uh, take advantage of this opportunity to ask something to this nice assembly, to this wonderful participant. In our discussion around the assembly, I have been asked to demand all friends of Africa, all Christians in the world, to help us to stop a practice which has to do with our dignity. Is this a phenomenon of identifying suffering, misery, and hopelessness with Africa? <laughs> whoever wants to talk about HIV and AIDS, whoever in each part of the world use images of Africans, even those who face a hopelessness leading given to suicide as if suffering and misery and despair is only not, not in the other part of the world. We want that phenomenon to stop and please help us to end it. General Secretary, I am ending because I promised to speak only four minutes. <laughs> we have uh, underlined the challenge of managing our diversities. And I think the problem we have at the ecumenical movement are simply due to the fact that the family has extended. And in Africa, we know it, we like families. When, when the family became bigger and bigger, it became difficult to manage it. So that is what also we are facing as a communical movement. But called to be the salt and the right of earth, we will continue to count on the coordinating role of the WCC and on its leadership. And your, the role of WCC, no one else can play it. And we are happy because this extended family has not lost the main references, and the main reference is Jesus Christ. I want to congratulate you sincerely for this well organized assembly, the content, logistics, and the good atmosphere of this participant. Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, we can grow together and make our unity of vision, at least unity of vision and action, we make it a reality and we make it for the glory of God. Let me end by this prayer again.
WCC vision, God of life, leaders to justice and peace. Allow me to add dignity, with dignity, not only for Africa, but also for the whole world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andre, for your warm and also inclusive message to us. We thank you and other sisters and brothers from Africa for your leadership in the whole ecumenical movement. We have received a lot of other greetings and they are posted on the internet, for example from our Hindu guest, Professor Punyani from India, from the local church council in Geneva, from the Life and Peace Institute and many others. You know and understand well that we cannot, for the time limited available here, present all of them, but we receive them with great appreciation. Now we are ready to go on with the justice plenary. Thank you so much. Okay, we have to give them another hand clap, right? <laughs> what an amazing testimony of hope to have the children with us this morning. They are beautiful. 
Well, the children leave us with some very hard questions, don't they? We are forced to ask two different questions given this is the justice plenary when we think about the children. So we begin this plenary by asking these two questions. One, what kind of world are we living in? What kind of world are we living in? And second, what kind of world will they, the children, live in in 15 to 20 years? These are the two questions that will found or create the foundation for our time together. In the previous days, plenaries have addressed the issues of unity, mission, Asia, and the assembly's theme. With this plenary, together with the one we will have tomorrow, we will try to deepen some aspects of the theme of the assembly, God of life, lead us to justice and peace. Yes, we are going to explore with some guests some of the challenges the world is facing, those issues facing us regarding justice. The prevailing globalized culture seems to accept and legitimize social, economic, and ecological injustice. So much so that human ecological abuse, exclusion, and impoverishment of the vulnerable and the denial of rights and dignity of many, particularly people with disabilities, women, children, and people with HIV and AIDS are increasingly seen as inevitable fallouts in a world gripped by the logic of dominion, growth, and greed. This institutionalization of injustice is an outstanding mark of our present civilization posing very serious challenges to the moral and spiritual integrity of our generation. Injustice has always been a part of human history, but the injustice of our generation to the earth and to our own brothers and sisters does not seem to have parallels. We will also learn how the churches are responding to these challenges. Churches need to recognize the moral imperative of confronting justice as an integral part of, quote, costly discipleship. For the WCC in particular, justice has been at the core of our work. We all know WCC involvement in the struggle against apartheid, in solidarity with women, and for eco-justice. This is part of the legacy of the ecumenical movement. Now, as you see, this stage has been transformed into a mandong, where we will have a conversation with four guests who will join us in the reflection on these principles that have been outlaid in these comments. Please welcome with me our first guest, Mr. Martin Kaur. He is welcome to the Madang space. He is the executive director of the South Center, an intergovernmental policy research and analysis information institution of developing countries to come to the table. You are welcome. <laughs> we now invite our second guest, Dr. Julia Ducro. Welcome, Julia. You're welcome to the Madang space. Thank you. She is the head of the Human Rights and Peace Department of Bread for the World, a specialized ministry related to the Protestant churches in Germany. We now welcome our third guest, Bishop Joseph Opatara. Bishop, you're welcome. Yeah. You're welcome to the Madang space. <laughs> he is coming to us from the Ecumenical Patriarchate, the General Vicar of the Archbishop Archdiocese of Buenos Aires and South America. And he will also share with us in Spanish, so make sure you have your headphones ready. And now for our fourth guest, Reverend Pumazili Mabezila. Welcome, Thank coming you. from South Africa. You're welcome to the Madan space. <laughs> 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 
She is the executive director of Inarela and the International Network of Religious Leaders Living With or Personally Affected by HIV and AIDS. Let's tune in to their comments. Now, before we get started, for all of you who like notepads like I do, or computers and cell phones, you can tweet your responses. Now, are we ready? We have a wonderful opportunity to learn about some very important issues around justice. We've heard from the children. We have hope in the children. But what are we going to do to prepare for their future? These are the questions we are wrestling with. We will begin with you, Mr. Clore. Could you please say a word about the importance of economy, uh, climate change, and finance relative to the matters of justice? Thank you. Uh, I'm coming from the South Center. It's an organization of 52 uh, developing country governments. And we are the think tank for them to look at all these issues. And there are two ways of looking at justice. You can do justice when something wrong has gone wrong, then you wipe up the mess. Try to give money to the poor and so on. But that doesn't really get to the roots of the problem. So what we need to do is to look at the policies that have been designed that lead to poverty, injustice and so on. And then we need to tackle those policies at the root if we are really to solve this problem. So I just want to bring up four uh, major issues where we are concerned. The first is the world financial crisis. We are all suffering from it. And the reason is that uh, the governments, particularly in the United States and Europe, mm. they have designed uh, the economy in such a way as to give priority to the financial institutions. It wasn't like that before. After the Second World War, finance was relatively tame and regulated. You can't transfer money abroad unless you are trading and so on. But today, they have deregulated so that finance becomes a monster in itself mm. that needs to be re-regulated because they have caused this monstrous 19, uh, uh, the, the 2008 crisis which goes on until today. So because of the greed of those who control these financial institutions and work on them, they have disrupted the whole global economy, including in the developing countries including through the unregulated flows of funds from the developed countries to the developing countries. When the funds come in, it causes a lot of problems. Korea also has suffered from these problems and many of us. And when the funds flow out, because interest rates have gone back uh, up in Europe or the United States, then you cause a lot of devastation again. Remember the, the crisis that we had in 1998? Mm -hmm. So the re-regulation of finance is something that is very important that we need to call for, we need to understand the issues, and we need to call for reforms. I'm happy to say that the World Council of Churches organized this Sao Paulo meeting and came out with the Sao Paulo Declaration, a very comprehensive and sophisticated uh, uh, declaration with many recommendations that we should follow up on. And the second issue is on the trade rules. We are having rules in the WTO and in new free trade agreements. For example, we are negotiating the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement in this part of the world, and they contain many provisions, many rules that are very unfair. For example, the rules on agriculture allow the rich countries to continue to subsidize their agricultural sector to the tune of $400 billion a year, when developing countries are not allowed to subsidize because you have to cut your subsidies by 20%. When your subsidy is zero, you are not allowed to have one dollar of subsidy. Mm. And the reason for this is that uh, uh, the rules are designed in such a way to suit the rich countries that they can continue their subsidies whilst the poor are not able to do so. I did a study on Africa and I found that uh, the African countries were doing very well in agriculture and food production. But then when the World Bank and IMF came in because these countries fell into debt, they were asked to cut their tariffs down to almost zero, and the government was asked to withdraw their subsidies to agriculture. As a result of which, the efficient farmers of Africa could not compete against the cheap imports that were coming in that were being sold below production costs. Whether it's chickens from Europe or whether it's rice from the United States, tomato from, uh, from uh, Europe and so on. And Africa is not able to produce its own food. 
And what do we do? We say, oh, these Africans don't know how to produce their own food. And uh, we feel very good when we... <clears throat> we feel very good for our conscience when we donate food to them as food aid. And we say that it's justice. <laughs> it is not justice. <clears throat> Another very bad rule in the, uh, in, in, the, in the WTO, which is made worse by the free trade agreements, is on intellectual property rights. I'm sure my sister will be talking about it. Yes. But we have studied these rules that say that these medicines are patented. It is compulsory for you to patent them. They were selling the AIDS medicine, as you know, for $15,000 per patient per year until an Indian company was able to produce it. And today they are selling at $60 per patient per year. But new medicines that are coming on are being sold very expensively. If you have cancer, you need $6,000 to treat a cancer patient per month. Now, fortunately, an Indian company is able to produce for $200, but then you need a compulsory license. It is very, very cumbersome. Many millions of lives are being lost that way. We have to re-examine intellectual property rules in relation to essential medicines at least. And then we have something you may not have heard of, the bilateral investment treaties. This is the latest scandal that we are examining. All our governments were signing these treaties thinking that they would bring in foreign investments, mm. but now it is shown through the tribunals the investor, the, the, the company, the foreign company is able to sue the government for loss of future profits. And what is the loss of future profits? If the government introduces a new policy, environment or health or economic, that affects the future revenue of this company, the company can sue and claim back all the compensation in relation to future losses in an international court, thereby bypassing the national laws. Many of our countries are now being sued. Ecuador had an award against it for $2.3 billion because it cancelled the contract of an American company that had violated the contract by selling itself to another company. The court said, yes, that company has violated the contract but nevertheless, it has lost money, so please pay this company $2.3 billion. We have similar cases being taken up against Indonesia, against India, against many other uh, countries and so on. And finally, on the environmental side, on climate change, biodiversity and so on, the rich countries have already damaged their own environment and damaged the global environment through their industrial revolution and all the policies that they have since then. We have very limited environmental space left, whether it's climate change or whether it's resources. They have to be shared in a fair manner. Those who have already grown rich by exploiting the world's resources must now change their lifestyles. They have to give up. Mr. Kaur, thank you very much. You have outlined They have to very... change their lifestyle so that we have the space. Thank you very much. You have given us a powerful thank beginning. You. Thank you very much, Mr. Kaur. <laughs> <laughs> now we have three other powerful speakers to come for some interventions, and that is going now to human rights. Dr. Ducro, tell us something about human rights and how it relates to what our brother has shared. Yeah, so I think human rights are of utmost importance to create mm. an equal and just society, especially because it, it, it creates accountability for state policies and state activities. And I think it's nothing new to the World Council of Churches to work on human rights and, and uh, uh, enforce human rights, especially with its uh, program to combat racism in the past. It has done really big work to shape the human rights perspective there. And I think it comes from the faith-based perspective that human beings are made in the image of God and human dignity imparts in all human beings, no matter which faith they come from, no matter which race, which group, whatever, and even if they have no faith. And I think the idea of a protection of human dignity is in the core as well of human rights. And human rights spell out in different conventions uh, and resolutions and so on, which are the obligations of state to 
protect this human dignity by protecting the civil, political rights, but also the economic, uh, social and cultural rights. And that means, for example, for the local levels, local governments, uh, local authorities, that they have to provide for equal access to education, for example, or equal access to health. But also on a global level, it puts obligation on states. Mm. For example, to create a good new framework for sustainable development goals in 2015, which are rooted on human rights and uh, which who will then be a post uh, development to, to combat poverty so I think this is the importance of uh, human rights and I think we all know you know that this uh, human rights don't fall from the sky mm -hmm. there always have been uh, a result of struggles of people to implement human rights but also to create new perspective and new uh, instruments of human rights and I think this is the role we have as church to support these struggles to create new uh, human rights instruments and to ask for the implementation of human rights. And, um, for example, there is a new field, you were mentioning this, the, 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 the um, activities of private corporations. We um, see you know, that many private corporations, uh, multinational corporations or companies do violate human rights, especially we have this example of the POSCO company in Orissa, in the Indian in India, in the state of Orissa, where about 30,000 people will, le will lose their livelihood just because a company will cr construct a steel company and so on and def uh, create deforestation there. Mm. And I think it's really important to find ways to make also private companies accountable mm. to human rights. And uh, we have to support organizations and civil society. We have to stand side by side civil society organizations and unions, churches, and so on, despite the fact that at the moment there is a move that NGO laws are entrenched and people are being put into jail and so on. So the political space for civil society activity to create a better human rights framework and ask for implementation and uh, fulfillment of the state obligations is shrinking. And I think this is where our responsibility lies to support these. Dr. Dupal, thank you. And thank you for transitioning us into the theological perspective surround human dignity and human identity. We are now going to go to Bishop Joseph, who is going to be speaking in Spanish. Would you please give us now a theological perspective on these issues? Alguien alguna vez le preguntó al maestro, ¿cuál es el mandamiento más grande de la ley? Y el maestro respondió, amarás al Señor tu Dios con todo tu espíritu, con toda tu mente y con todo tu corazón. Este es el mandamiento más grande, pero existe otro que es similar. Amarás al prójimo como a ti mismo. Así también el maestro nos dio otro mandamiento en otra parte del Evangelio que se identifica con este primero. Es el mandamiento nuevo, que se amen los unos a los otros como yo los he amado. Esa es, de acuerdo a nuestra perspectiva, la base de la justicia. El mandamiento del Señor el mandamiento del amor porque no hay justicia sin amor porque no hay justicia sin Dios ese Dios que desde el principio de todas las cosas crea por amor ese Dios que mantiene toda su creación por amor ese Dios que redime a esa creación por amor y la perfecciona sin límites hasta la segunda parucía de Jesucristo. Todo eso es la justicia de Dios. Todo eso es el amor de Dios al cual nosotros estamos llamados. Es por eso que no podemos llegar a la justicia. Es por eso que no 
podremos llegar a la paz si no lo tenemos a Cristo. Es por eso que el camino para la justicia verdadera, para la paz verdadera, es uno y único. Volver a Cristo. Al fin y al cabo, el problema de la justicia en este mundo no es un problema moral o ético. Creo que en última instancia es un problema espiritual. Si queremos justicia y paz, tenemos que querer a Cristo. Si no hay Cristo, no va a haber justicia. Cristo es la esperanza. Cristo es la justicia de Dios encarnada. Y Cristo está con nosotros. Y si Cristo está con nosotros, nosotros somos las imágenes de Cristo en este mundo, en este mundo que como hemos escuchado tiene tantas injusticias, este mundo de la injusticia, el cual pareciera que es muy difícil de cambiar, quizás para nosotros sí, quizás para nosotros sea muy difícil y casi imposible, pero para Dios no es imposible, para Dios con nosotros. Y sobre todas las cosas, y voy a ser más atrevido, para Dios en nosotros no es imposible. Por eso, si queremos la justicia, retornemos a Cristo. Hay muchas formas. Todas las formas que el Espíritu Santo ha permitido y permite en todos los ámbitos en los cuales se vive la presencia. Porque el Espíritu es libertad, el Espíritu es diversidad y es por eso que tenemos muchas formas de hacerlo. Estar nosotros o no, elegir si queremos a Cristo, si queremos la paz y la justicia. Si lo queremos así, el ejercicio y todas las formas que nos permitan hacerlo nos llevarán primero a Cristo luego a la justicia y a la paz en el amor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bishop. We now turn to Reverend Mabazila, who is going to tell us about health issues. What about the health issues and how they relate to justice issues? Thank you very much. Um, As a religious leader who is openly living with HIV, mm. I'd like to congratulate the World Council of Churches, firstly for giving me a platform to speak for myself. I think one of the injustices that have been perpetrated by the church is taking and using our authority to speak on behalf of those who are not in the forefront. Mm. And uh, it's important for us as people who are directed, directly affected by issues to be able to speak for ourselves. We also have this gift of dignity and we have a lot to share with the church. One, another, another thing that I would like to say is that the issue of justice should not be an optional extra for the church. It should be the core of our ministry. And um, it's, It's not the responsibility of NGOs to understand some of these frameworks and some of these policies that you were talking about. But we as the people who believe in a God of justice should understand them and hold our governments accountable. On the issue of healing, we as the church have lied to people. We have privatized the whole thing of healing and we have told people that if you don't have faith, you shall not be healed. Mm. We need to be prophets and say to people, you have a right to healing and give people appropriate, accurate information. Therefore, it's our responsibility to empower ourselves with comprehensive strategies that have been developed all over the world to help us fully understand HIV, not only as a medical issue, but also as a social justice issue. Mm. It is very sad that in this meeting, 
uh, almost 30% of us are from rich countries. And these are the very same countries that have deprived people like myself who are living with HIV of the right to access to medicine. And this is greed, and we need to call it as such. We need to challenge them and be advocates and make sure that all the people in the world who need to have access to, to medicine have access to medicine because medicines are a gift from God. Mm -hmm. Medicines need to be seen not as a curse. We know that there are pastors who are telling people, stop taking your medication. You will be healed if I pray for you. You can only treat some of these conditions, but it's only God who heals. Mm. Then there's the issue of gender injustice. We as the church, we have used our sacred text to justify gender injustice. Mm. That is why women continue to be violated. That is why we have such high rates of rape mm. within our countries is because we as the church are silent and have actually influenced people's attitudes towards how we view women as such. Mm. I would like to say that we as women are the backbone of the church. Mm. If we were to walk away from the church, there would be no church. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Therefore, it's important for our leaders to reinterpret the gospel mm. so that it makes sense to me as a village woman who is living with HIV. Mm. This patriarchal and androcentric language that we have used for a very long time is very destructive and has diminished the image of God within me. Mm. Mm. So these are the issues that I wanted to say that as an institution, we have the responsibility to be advocates. When we get invited to important meetings that are organized by the UN agencies, let us use those opportunities to hold them accountable and challenge them to remember the poor of the poorest who also have a voice and can be agents as well. I know you join me in thanking all of these wonderful persons who have brought these interventions. <laughs> Now, I have good news and bad news. The bad news is we're coming close to the end of our time. <laughs> the good news is I have time for one more point of conversation. <laughs> so to all of you, this is the World Council of Churches. We have church leaders from all over the world, lay, clergy, men, women, young, old. What do you want to tell these friends what it is they can do specifically very clearly, when they leave Busan, Mr. Ford. You know, when I was a student, I was in the Young Christian Students, mm -hmm. and we had this big debate among ourselves, is it enough to pray or is it enough to do good work? There was a pray versus do good work. And of course, we came to the conclusion we had to do both, see, judge, and act. Mm. And if you look at uh, Jesus Christ himself, I don't think he just got millions of people around him living in a castle and asking them to pray. He did that. Of course he did. But he also acted. When he went to the temple and he saw that uh, there were greedy people who were excessively making profit by selling things. It's not that they were selling things like we do in our exhibition downstairs, but they were making profit. <laughs> excessively from selling things. He mm. said, get rid of all these mm. things. He went into action himself, spontaneous mm. action. Mm. Similarly, he said that, uh, I pity all these rich people because it's more difficult for them to go to heaven <laughs> than for a camel. <laughs> Jesus was very strict, huh? than for a camel to, to go through the eye of a needle. Right? Now, I don't think he was saying, you people are finished and condemned. He's saying, you have to reform. Yeah. And you have to reform, and you have to reform the system itself. But if you don't reform, the people have to reform the system. So I think, for the World Council of Churches, you have been advocates for justice before. I have participated in many justice campaigns of the World Council of Churches. 
you are entering into new campaigns, whether it is for fair trade, whether it's for access to medicine, whether it's to overturn the global financial system that is so corrupt today. And what is important is for the church, whether it's the ordinary people or for the leaders, to keep pace with current events as they take place and to analyze the root causes and that we go for the root causes so that we are able to address these root causes rather than allow the situation to deteriorate and then we just do good by helping the poor through charity. The poor do not need charity, they need us to tackle the structural causes and the structures that give rise to this very sinful situation that we have today. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Poor. <laughs> Reverend Mabubalese, go ahead. Thank you. Prayer is very important, and that is something that we can do very well. <clears throat> However, prayer on its own shall not bring us justice. It needs to go together with actions where we speak out as, um, as advocates and prophets. We need to go out of our safe ministries and uh, distress those who are comfortable and comfort those who are in distress. Mm -hmm. And I really believe that <laughs> important issues like our sexuality, whether it's heterosexuality or homosexuality, should be right in the center of our mission. We cannot ignore the fact that we, as the body of Christ, we are diverse, and we need to embrace that diversity and actually use it to strengthen our voice to strive for justice. Thank you very much, Reverend. Now we go to Bishop Joseph, and again in Spanish. Gracias. Yo voy a terminar solamente con un deseo muy cortito y creo que con sentido. Yo le deseo a todos a Cristo. Ningún otro deseo más. Mm. Que cuando salgamos de esta asamblea todos tengamos en nuestro horizonte a Cristo. Y que nos identifiquemos con Él y que vayamos y que activemos esta presencia de Cristo en nosotros. Y que no sean solamente palabras, sino que sean acciones proféticas con atrevimiento sin dejar de ser lo que uno es pero también dejando de lado todos los prejuicios que nos atan a nosotros a nuestras confesiones quizás a nuestra propia religiosidad también para poder ser libres y poder actuar a Cristo en el mundo Cristo para todos ustedes Thank you Bishop Dr. Durukro yeah, I think um, we see that many uh, 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 people who, who fight and question the root causes of the structures, who uh, fight for better environmental issues, who, who demonstrate against nuclear plants, or um, who question really injustices, are under pressure at the moment. And I think this is what I would like to say to, to the people here when they go back. Look at those who fight for justice and who fight against uh, the ecological crisis and who question the system, you see they are under pressure and stand by side with them and support human rights defenders, protect them and show that you are side by side and that you support that struggle. I think that's what we have to do. Join me in thanking our panelists once more. All right, this is a talk show, so that means there are people in the audience who have something to say. So we have identified three people who have something to say to the panelists and to you. And if you have something to say and you're not one of the three, it's called tweeting. <laughs> it's called email. Do it and we will hear from you. Please, we want to bring now our audience participants, Reverend Luz. Reverend Luzma, there he is, he's coming. Welcome to our Mandang space. <laughs> Reverend Luzama is coming from Tuvalu. Welcome. What intervention would you like to offer today? Um, 
I would like to talk about justice and injustice of climate change. Mm. I come from Tuvalu, mm. an independent small island country in the middle of the vast Pacific Ocean. Mm. And the highest point in my country is four meters above sea level. Mm. And mind you, this is just a point. The rest of the country is below that. Um, my people are facing the brunt of the negative impacts of climate change. Mm. Their very um, lives are being challenged and being um, in stake. The traditional way of life of the people in which they have depended on for survival has been challenged. The, every sphere of life is threatened from food security to health to our very identity. In fact, the totality of our very survival and existence as a people on the face of the, this planet is in stake. Mm. So, mind you, I'm not only speaking about Tuvalu here. Mm. I am speaking about every individual countries in the Pacific. Even the low-lying vulnerable countries in the world mm. which are facing the same threats from climate change. And this challenges all also our spirituality because if we look at the flood narrative, we see that uh, those who caused the problem were the ones who were swimming in the sea. Mm. And the victims or those who did not take part in creating this problem mm. were the ones who were on the ark of salvation. Mm. In the face of climate change, the question always comes up, why us? Why do we face, we have to face the consequences of something that we have no part in? Mm -hmm. mm. Why are we being punished? And where is justice mm. in this? And I would like to challenge WCC on this. How do we ensure to the people that are being affected by climate change and sea level rise and assurance of life continuity and their dignity and their identity will continue? How do we for me personally and my people, we don't want the pity of the world. Mm. We want you to stand in solidarity with us in action. Mm. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you, Reverend Usama. Please join us in our Madang space. We will make room for you. <laughs> and now we have another intervention that is coming from Greece. We welcome Dr. Andrianos. Where is Dr. Andrianos? Oh, here he comes. Welcome from Greece. You are welcome to the Mondon space. What would you like to tell our audience today? Thank you very much. I live in Greece, and uh, Greece, as all you know, is suffering from the economic crisis mm -hmm. in Europe. So I'd like to share with you uh, the history of my life mm. uh, in uh, that uh, context. Mm. So just to start, I want to thank God for this moment. It's so historical for eco-justice. I want to thank also our ecumenical patriarchate, a green patriarch, His All Holiness Bartolomeo, for taking me part as delegate for eco-justice issues. Mm. So I was born in Madagascar, uh, in a, a family, very Christian, but mixed with Catholic and Protestant. And uh, I was granted a uh, scholarship to study in Greece for doctoral studies in uh, ecological uh, economics and sustainable development, and in, in Crete. So during my studies, my mother came to visit me, and, uh, but she passed away. Oh. And, uh, 
I experienced the kindness of a church, of Greek church at that time, and uh, I got married with a Greek lady. So we have now three small kids, like in Kintota Sank Choe, and I'm very concerned about the future of my kids. I'm, uh, before the economic crisis in Europe, life in Greece was just simple, normal, but beautiful. Mm. After the economic crisis, life is very difficult in Greece. Mm. Many people lose their jobs. My wife is jobless since the economic crisis. Mm. I also lost my position at university and oh. uh, I stopped funding my job at the Orthodox Academy of Crete, but um, many, many people are suffering hunger and uh, homelessness, not because they don't have food, but because they don't have money, because the bankers, because of the, all the rich institutional financial systems want to put taxes, want to just make a structural greed in power. Mm -hmm. So, many people are just killing themselves. We mm -hmm. hear every day a suicide in Greece because they are hopeless. Mm -hmm. They find money is just everything. If you don't have money, there is no mm -hmm. meaning to live. Mm -hmm. So, people are killing between themselves because there is a race also of these neo-Nazi followers. Mm. You cannot imagine they are just killing themselves. It's a hate. It's an economy of greed which promotes hate, promotes hunger. Mm. So I would like here to challenge the WCC and first to thank the WCC because of the issue of eco justice is raised, but that is not enough. I would challenge the WCC to put more actions and concrete and denounce this economic and financial greed which is <laughs> govern our life. Mm. I pray that the WCC and all the churches will be the living hope for this world and we will not serve the gospel of pro prosperity but we live with the gospel for the poor, the gospel of humility, and the gospel for economy of life. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Angiano, you're welcome to the Madan space. Please come. And now we have our last intervention from Ms. Mvula. She's coming from Malawi. Please welcome her. You are welcome to the Madan space. Please come. Tell us your intervention. My name is Shalini Mfula. Uh, I would like to talk some of the things as young people who are living with HIV we want from the church. Mm -hmm. I was born with HIV. I'm 19 years old. Mm -hmm. As young people who are living with HIV, we want counseling to be done in the churches, not only in the hospitals, so that we can be counseled spiritually. Like, just like she said, we want to be healed. We want healing ministries through our churches. So we want some counseling to be done in our churches. Secondly, we also want sex education to be done in our churches. Because sex ed education, it is only done in the hospitals. We don't want this. We want sex education to, to, to first be done in the churches. Mm. Mm. And as young people who are living with HIV, we've got a lot of questions. I wonder if I may, if I may get married and have children. And so it is very important that, that um, se sexual reproductive health and um, so it is very important that sexual reproductive health should be discussed in our churches because some of the questions which we have can be answered by our church readers. <laughs> Besides that, I'm HIV positive. I don't want to have children who are HIV positive. Mm -hmm. I want to have children who are HIV negative. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> and lastly, I would like to pinpoint on this. HIV and AIDS is not, is not a punishment from God. It is just a disease. So let's join us in the fight of this disease. Thank you. You are very strong and very courageous. You are so welcome to the Madang space. Please come with me. Please. Thank you. Well, I don't know about you, but I know I have been moved by the stories. Have you not been moved by these stories? Can you imagine we have so much talent in this room? Here we have heard these interventions. We now know when we have leadership from the churches, there is hope. We have heard the theological perspectives. We have heard the stories. We have heard the issues. Now the question lies with you again. What will you do? What stories will you listen to when you go home? What stories will you listen to differently than when you came? What will be your strategy? How will you work ecumenically? How will you work across interfaith lines to make a difference for Christ? I know that I have been energized and I have been inspired by the stories and the interventions. Do you join me in this inspiration? We give thanks to God for you and what you are doing in your countries, in your neighborhoods, and wherever you may be. We thank God for the World Council of Churches who has brought us together for yet another assembly, having been here since 1948. We give thanks to God for what you will yet do as we lead up to the next assembly for justice. So we want to close this time together in a way that is appropriate. Being Christians as we are, we know that all the leading comes from Christ. So we want to invite you now to rise. Oh no, sorry. I'm right, I thought I was right. We want to invite you now to rise for a prayer. After this prayer together, we will have a song that will recess us to the journey of the missions to which we've been called. Please join us for the prayer after the gong and the drums. No gong. There is no gong, so we begin to pray. Ready. God of justice, you have poured out your gifts upon us through your Holy Spirit. May we use them to live out your reign of justice. Amen. Let us repeat the theme. God, God of life, life, lead us to justice, justice and peace. peace. One more time. God, God of life, God lead us, us to justice and peace. peace. Amen. 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 The song is number 21 in your book, Hallelujah. If you want to look it up, we sang it this morning, Until All Are Fed. We invite you to join us when you are able to find it.
God bless you and have a beautiful day. Hello, well.